Okay, so I'm going to start right now and say forgive me. Sometimes I may babble in this thing. I just got off a plane from Hong Kong. I've been flying for 24 hours, so forgive me. Um, I'm going to fly through some things because if you're here, you're interested in this stuff, and you should at least either know this stuff or look, up, look it up on your own. If at any time you guys want me to slow down, just say, hey, whoa, 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 can you explain that more? No problem. I do my presentations a little bit more old school so you can print them and read them and not all the fancy colors so you can at least use them. There's a lot of things here that are like formulas and things that I don't really expect you to absorb today, but it's for later. I'll, I'll get this up on Chief uh, the Media stuff as soon as I can. My MiFi wasn't working. I was trying to get it up before this presentation, but couldn't do it. So we're going to run through a bunch of stuff. It's all about practical, practical design and engineering. With the robot stuff, if you take the software stuff out of it, in the hardware, you've got design and you've got engineering, right? Then you have execution and all the other stuff that goes around with it. But they're two different things. There's lots of people who do great designs, but they don't do the right engineering and stuff breaks. Lots of people who do good engineering, but they miss some design aspects, <coughs> like my team this year, um, which we'll get into. The engineering was sound, but the design is lacking a little bit. So I'm going to talk more about the engineer stuff because most teams in first are starting to get the design part of it, but I see a lot of really good designs that could be like awesome if they did a little bit of math. So Excel's your friend. If you don't know Excel, if you don't have Excel, get open Excel, get whatever. Uh, Google Docs, spreadsheets, okay. I'm an Excel snob, so it's not good enough for me, but if you can't afford Excel or your company doesn't buy it for you like mine does, um, it, it can do pretty much anything you need when it comes to numbers. So, a couple useful tools that everyone in this room should use is uh, John D. Noon, uh, Mechanical Design Calculator. It's on CD Media. He's done a bunch of different iterations of it. Uh, during this presentation, I am going to um, flip between all the different programs because I want to show you uh, John's Design Calculator is one of them. He has a bunch of... Oh, you can't really see there. Excel's not going to look good here. Control plus. Yeah, the bottom corner you scroll control scroll and multiply. Yeah, but I don't do that. I have a 30-inch monitor. I don't need to do that. <laughs> All right. uh, yeah, so you still can't read, but basically he's got single speed drivetrain, he's got two speed drivetrain, he has um, mechan rotary mechanism, linear mechanism, intake mechanism. But he also has all the motor specs that are current for this year, except he still has all the Fisher-Price stuff because he believes they're coming back. But um, you can copy and paste into the different things. I did that for ours. I have our design stuff. I use his stuff for all my preliminary analysis. Um, download it. Play with it. It'll also help you learn uh, how some of this stuff works. Um, I used this conference as an excuse to finally do the thing I said I was going to do. And I put a bunch of useful calculations that I use every single year, but they're in like Paul speak, and I kind of try to make them in one location that is pretty um, useful for other people. So I'll go through a little bit of that. Again, this is all about practical stuff. All right, constants and formulas. Don't expect you to deal with this. I don't care if you're designing your robot in English, metric, whatever. Do all your math in metric. You'll make less mistakes because it's easier to figure out. So some of the big conversions are pounds to newtons, inches to meters, foot-pounds to newton meters, RPMs to radians per second. Do all your rotational stuff in radians per second, then you don't have to worry about 2 pi or any of that. You just do it. I mean, pi is great. Don't get me wrong. But you just get to radians per second, and, and, and you'll be much better. Robot velocity, torque, force, pressure, mechanical power, electrical power, and friction. We'll go through some of these in detail. But again, this is for future reference. Okay, don't be afraid. Motor formulas. All seven of these are different mathematical ways to represent DC motors in a very easy way. Uh, torque, rotational speed, current, um, that's pretty, and power. Okay, Those are the four things you need to make sure you don't burn out motors or you have enough, pow have enough motor torque to do your job or you have enough power to do the job in the speed you want to do it in. And again, We'll get into the details. This is for future reference. I use three, three and four all the time now since we have so many motors. 
um, and it's, we do a lot of combining motors. It's really hard to figure out what each individual motor is contributing. I think I got that problem solved, and um, it, it opens your eyes to a whole new world of what's going on. Okay, traction. I have to say this. 90% of these slides are from Ken Patton. Completely ripped off from Ken Patton. Uh, we did a presentation together a while back. He had half the slides. I had half the slides. I liked his, so I'm using them. But we're going to fly through this. <coughs> Traction. Normal force. Coefficient. Of, who, who's familiar with Who's not familiar with this? Okay, great. We'll fly through. So you guys get that. Here's an interesting way to figure out coefficient of friction. It has nothing to do with nothing except the angle at which. So when you want to test stuff, you want to test your robot's coefficient of friction, put the carpet or whatever the playing field of the year is, put it on some plywood, measure the rise and the run, and you can figure out your coefficient of friction. That's your real coefficient of friction. Um, you should do that test because, again, things you thought were good aren't, and things you thought were bad actually are pretty good. Okay, materials, shape, uh, material floor surface, and surface conditions. Materials of the wheels... You guys probably all have seen this. Soft stuff's really good, but it wears too fast. Hard stuff's eh, but it lasts forever, so find the balance. Um, shape. Uh, at Vex Pro, we played with this shape stuff a little bit with the Versa wheel. We thought that we were onto something. Um, we still believe it. It's uh, shape of the wheel digging into the carpet. Problem is, tape. Can't dig into the tape. So. But, so you can play with the material you're with, the shape, cutting, you know, buy wheels, cut, cut diamonds in them, cut X's in them, whatever, it'll help. I love this slide, I'm pretty nostalgic, some of you guys remember this. Yeah. Back in the day, you could use metal to contact the floor surface, you generate a ridiculous amount of coefficient of friction. Currently illegal now. Um, material of the floor surface, not up to you, sometimes they mess with us, like 2009, got really bad. Service conditions. This is one that most people miss. Uh, isopropyl alcohol is your friend. Get isopropyl alcohol, especially with the gum rubber type tires and the nitrile type tires. Rub it down after every match. Your coefficient of friction will be higher. And it's legal because it doesn't leave residue. <clears throat> Again, normal force, weight. Oh, my favorite picture of all time. 2002 IRI. That's young Andy, young and skinny Andy Baker back in the back there. That's 308's robot. They transferred ridiculous amounts of load to the robot so much so that they, the, the carpet didn't fail, the robot didn't fail, the carpet just started peeling up. So there's crazy things you can do with traction if you manipulate the numbers like you're supposed to. All right, we went fast through that because I just wanted to make sure everyone was at the same baseline. Power and motors. <coughs> Some people use graphs for motors. I only use it to kind of explain the basic principles, but everyone in here probably is already there. So I use numbers for everything because I use Excel. So every motor, DC motor, can be approximated pretty darn closely, especially the way we use them, by a line. There's four numbers. There's four numbers that matter. Stall torque, free speed, stall current, and free current. Free speed, speed at which, there's no torque generated. It's the fastest your motor can go. Stall torque, no speed, maximum torque you have. Stall current and free current are the corresponding current draw that the motor has at those two spots. It's all you need. It's everything. Slope intercept form. Some of us haven't used it in a long time. Some of us probably have used it recently. Um, it's your friend. It's a straight line. Slope intercept form is the best way. Turns out for a DC motor, the slope of the line with a speed torque curve is the negative of the stall torque divided by the free speed. Pretty straightforward. And the y-intercept, if your current, if your torque is on the y-axis, is your stall torque. So the equation for a motor goes into a pretty simple form. Uh, negative stall torque divided by free speed times the speed that you're at plus T stall. Those seven equations or whatever I did in the front, it's really just a manipulation. Two of them are just the manipulation of that equation, right? Just rearranging terms to get speed in terms of torque, torque in terms of speed. You can do the same thing for current, although it's not as simple because um, there, there's a, a non-zero term because of the free current. So, um, again, you can derive it yourself. It's very simple, but the final answer is on page three or whatever there. All right, power. Power, power it's all about power. Power is absolute. You only have so much, and you can trade torque off for speed. That's it. 
if you if you're not fast enough, you or you have not enough torque, it's not enough speed, you need to add power. There's really two ways to add power realistically in electric DC motors. Increase the battery voltage, which currently isn't legal in FRC, and add motors to your system. So let's add motors, because that's fun. Max power occurs when <coughs> stall torque when the torque is at stall torque divided by two and the corresponding speed is at free speed divided by two. Does everybody believe me? <laughs> do you want me to prove it? Yes. We'll do, I'll do it later. <laughs> I will prove it now. Oh, it's timed. Yes. I will prove it right now then. Okay, let's go back to... I was hoping someone would say yes. Because then it wouldn't be my fault. All right. This equation right here is power, torque times speed. Very, very, very simple. Take the torque equation and multiply it by rotational speed. You get that. Combine the terms, you get that. Anybody know how to find the maximum of a curve? What do you do? Take the derivative. And then set that to? Zero. Yep. You do that. This turns two. Two times that thing times omega plus that thing equals zero, right? Say yes, yes. Yeah. Subtract so this over here, you got stall torque over here, right? Right, yeah, of course. Sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> See, I have to do it on my paper, I can't do it in my head. All right, it all reduces down to, um, to stall torque that, uh, that the, the x position is omega over two. Okay, so you got stall torque on the left, divide both sides by stall torque, that goes away. You got omega over two. Omega equals omega equals t, t stall over two. Okay? So you plug that back into either the speed or torque formula, and they're both over two. You can do that yourself on paper right now if you'd like. That's and who said derivatives weren't useful? You know I'm going to lose my place, right? I told you I had sleep deprivation. So you, okay, power is absolute. We did that. Oh, yeah, max power. There it is. Okay. What if the max power of a motor that we use occurs at a current higher than, let's say, 40 amps? That's pretty significant for us. Although some would argue that you can go a little more than 40 in a two-minute match, maybe 45 or 50. But let's use 40 because that's safe because you can... A sim motor can stay at 40 amps for two and a half to three minutes solid, no problem without the breaker trip. So design your drive motor max power for 40 amps. Well, what does that mean? It makes, it makes the motors look a lot different than you would think just by looking at max power, right? Because you always want to try to be around max power in your design condition. If you're lifting an arm, you want to be at max power, that's the fastest you can go. I mean, drivetrain, when you're in a pushing match, you want to be at max power. I mean, you always want to be there. So, most popular motors, uh, SIM, mini SIM bag, RS775, the 18 volt one, still my favorite motor. Everyone else hates them, but I do not. RS550, gosh, I gotta get rid of that timing. Sorry, guys. Um, I like it too. Good. RS550 and the Animark 9015. Um, so the top three are not convection cooled motors, the bottom three are. That means the bottom three use a fan to cool themselves. There's distinct disadvantages uh, to that, but they do have some advantages at high speed. Okay, motor comparisons. Big thing here, these are the big four. Here's the power, max, okay, uh, there's their max power, sorry. Here's their current at max power. I used like formula six to get this one. Um, and then here's their power at 40 amps. Now, uh, the caveat is some of these motors actually aren't at 40 amps. So the bag motor's max power is less than 40. So its power at 40 amps sucks. It's like two or something like that. But, um, but, it's, but the point is, where is its max power? Is it below 40? Yeah, it's at 146.6. Mini Sim, the original design intent was that its max power was right at 40 amps. Because Vex Pro, we, I got to design the motor, and I wanted to design a motor that's max power was where, where our current limits were. Uh, you know, the motor got a little faster than we wanted, but it's close enough. It lasts for like a minute and 50 seconds at max power, so I'm happy with that. But if you look, the motors get a lot, I mean, the sim motor looks ridiculously better than everybody else here, right? But when you start looking at 40 amps, that's why I like this guy, he's light. Um, but the motors start getting a lot closer. One thing that I'm going to publish later this summer, I wanted to get first approval because it's going to be a little controversial, is 
not all tests are created equal for motors. Some of these motors, including the SIM motor, is not tested per the industry standard. The only motors on this chart that are tested per the industry standard, I know because I did it, are the mini SIM and the bag motor. Um, you actually will show about a 15% max power reduction if you do the test the right way. So this summer, once I get first blessing, I've sent them all the data already, I'm going to publish what I call the real numbers. All tested on the same dyno, all tested the same way, all tested with the same test procedure, verified by an outside lab. Um, but it's about 15%. So if you run the bag motor test the same way that you, they've been running the 775-550 uh, test, that uh, max power is about 180. But it's a fake test, it's not real. So really the other ones have to get reduced. Big deal. Power at 40 amps is a big deal. You need to always consider it. All right, now we get into a little bit more fun stuff. I get to show my VEX Pro stuff. Oh, by the way, everybody here, uh, before you leave, I have a VEX Pro coupon code for 25 bucks, one-time use. So make sure I get you that code. Don't share it with anyone else because it's one-time use. So if they use it before you, you're out of luck. Um, so chain and belt and spur gears. I'm still not on the belt bandwagon yet. I'm a big proponent of prototyping and being flexible and right now I just haven't seen how belts can be flexible. We're going to try to work with Gates this summer to see if we can come out with some more flexible belting products, things with them, but who knows. So I'm a chain guy and a spur gear guy. Uh, pretty simple stuff. You guys all know this. Uh, the big gear divided by little gear, gear ratio. People design gear ratio differently. My gear ratio is very simple. If it's greater than one, it's speed reducing, torque increasing. If the gear ratio is less than one, it's speed increasing, torque reducing. Because most people use gears in a way that reduces speed, so using, always using numbers bigger than one just seems to make more sense to me. Uh, bevel gears, um, and FRC applications, I haven't really seen, like we used them a couple times early on, but I just don't think they're that necessary, but here they are. They, they're using industrial robots all the time, so if you ever wanted to play with them, they're pretty, pretty cool to play with. Be careful, they generate a boatload of axial load on your bearings. <clears throat> Worm gears, used those before. Those actually have some, <laughs> it's, it's because the new PowerPoint's doing weird stuff. Its defaults are different than the old one. Um, so it's timing me. Uh, so worm gears, uh, their gear ratio is a little different. Threads on the worm, teeth on the worm gear. Um, what's cool about those, if you do it right, you can get a horribly inefficient system, but it doesn't back drive. Sometimes you actually might like that if you can deal with the inefficiencies. Um, small package, super small package, super light. So on certain cases, like, like shooter angles this year, you didn't really need a lot of power, but you really wanted to stay home. A worm gear would have been nice. We didn't use one, but because, um, again, now we're all spoiled, right? Everyone's got gearboxes and, and spur gears. Everything's kind of optimized for us, so no one's done it with worm boxes yet. Well, Andy has, but not quite there yet to where everything else is. Plantier gear is my absolute favorite. This is a the design view of the 10 to 1 version of the Rex Pro versus Planetary. Um, former FRC student of mine, Alex Zettler, uh, was an intern at IFI last summer. He designed the entire Versa Planetary product line. I obviously checked it, but um, yeah, man, this stuff's applicable. FRC stuff's applicable. You can do, you can think of products and then and do them yourself. Um, planetary gears, why they're so awesome in FRC is they're small. They can take shock loads because it's multiple gears, teeth contacting. Okay, Th this particular one, the tooth contact ratio is 1.3. So you multiply that by three, and, and you've got some serious shock load ability um, if you design your gears right and you get the hardness right. Um, in this particular application, where it's called an actual planetary, the sun's the input, the ring gear's fixed, the carrier's the output. The gear ratio is number of teeth on the ring divided by number of teeth on the sun plus one. Small package, high gear ratio, flexible if you do them right. Chain is great, but tensioning sucks. I hate tensioning. I hate tensioners. Some of you have spent a great deal of cool things making tensioners. I just throw them away. I hate tensioners. So necessity drives all invention. So we did a ton of testing about five years ago trying to figure out how to get it right. So. When you use the number 35 chain, you use the number 25 chain, you get your center distance right. So 
even after it stretches, you don't ever, ever, ever have to tension your chain ever again. So, this is a view of the current Thunder Chicken Robot drive module. Um, it's uh, the butterfly drive thingy where the Omni wheels at one speed and the, the traction wheels at another. Not the point. 16 tooth sprocket to a 36 tooth sprocket. Our initial design was 4.5 inches between them. I'm like, yeah, that sounds good. Pretty even. Chain links. We're going to use number 25 chain. Um, so you have to carefully select your center distance. Um, machinery's handbook. Another thing for you students, if you're going into engineering school, get machinery's handbook. I make every single intern that works at IFI get that. I mean, IFI pays for it, but it has a ton of useful stuff. One of the things is for this chain um, is how to do chain. There's chain formula based on tolerances and all this great stuff. So. The formula, what I call the master formula for chain, is the CD is center distance in number of pitches. So number 25 chain is quarter inch pitch, number 35 chain is 3 eighths pitch. So using number 25 chain, 4.5 in number of pitches is 18. So there's, that's why I thought it was a nice number, nice and even, beautiful. 18 teeth pitches between them. I'm like, yeah, that should work great. Um, the number of links is by this crazy formula. So if you are quick with your math, you will see that if the two sprockets are the same size, the formula reduces to that, which that's why I thought 18 was going to be good. But different sizes. So 62.563 number of links. I looked all over the master, could not find a .563 link. So uh, now what? There's another formula. The number of links equals that mess right there. Round to the nearest even links. Why? Because I hate offset links. You need even links in your chain link, and otherwise you don't have to use a stupid little offset link. So I rounded to 62. You recalculate the center distance in inches with this formula. Lots of craziness. Again, the craziness goes away when the two sprockets are the same diameter. So for you guys who do all your gearing in the gearbox and then just chain to everything, the gear formula is much easier to deal with. Center distance is 4.429. Great. Now it's going to work, right? Wrong. Tolerances. Chains have very specific tolerances. One of them is they are at least as long as 0.25. They have a specific tolerance width. Through all of our testing, we came up with these two numbers. That's the number I implemented on the Thunder Chicken Drive this year. That had zero, zero issues with it. Um, we used the 12 thousandths one every other six wheel drive year. We used the 12 thousandths one on the drive chassis that we did this year, Vex Pro drive chassis. You add that much to this center distance, and then your tensioning will go. Is that go. a function of number of links? Nope. Loop? Turns out that it's not because the spec maxes out. So oh. per X amount of link, it maxes. So there's a tolerance, but it doesn't stack up forever. It only stacks up a okay. foot, I think. Yeah. Okay. So and that's all in machinery. Back and I, I backed it up with okay. I called the industry. It's actually an industry, but um. Because uh, uh, a lot of robots used to use this stuff, so they were really particular about it. So the tolerances are pretty well specced out. Um, although, Jim, for number 35, I suspect that at the super long links, I would probably go to 18 thousandths on the center distance, too. Um, but it's, uh, it works great. Now, because I hate those, those formulas are crazy, um, in the useful calculations little dealio that I made here, um, I actually do all that up here for you. So that first part, so these are the numbers from, from the, the, the Thunder Chicken Robot. 1636, 18 pitches, 62.563. You flip it, 62, quarter inch pitch, there's the center distance, and then there's the head and head. So it's pretty fast. You can iterate it pretty quickly. Um, so uh, I stand by those numbers. I use them myself. I think that I have had, we have had zero, we've been doing it for like four years, three years we've been implementing that system and our chain problem. Before that, we had chain nightmares like lots of other people used to, but motor combining. Okay, I can spend a two hour presentation on this <laughs> with what I've learned. One of the biggest things that we all have sucked at once since we've gone to two motors is understanding really, really how the motors share. Everyone says, got to match at three speed. I'm here to tell you, no way. No way. Matter of fact, it's the worst one to, to, to match. 
because nobody has a 100% efficient drivetrain or mechanism, so that means you're optimizing at a spot you can never get. Now, the thing you have to overcome emotionally is if you look at the numbers at free speed, one of the motors is a generator, meaning it's not actually generating, it's generating negative torque. Um, you can verify it if you take any of the two-speed transmissions out there, the Andy Mark ones, the Vex Pro ones, any of them, even your own, and you just have the gearbox sitting on the side and you put a, a meter, current meter, on the motors. One of them, because the manufacturing tolerances, one of them will be at a much lower current than the other just sitting in your hand. But that's okay, because once load goes on, they balance out nicely. So. Handy formulas. I got to thank Joe Johnson. He and I came to the same conclusion a completely different way. Mine was super complicated because I just took the formulas, didn't simplify anything, and just had this big, massive equation. His is much cleaner, especially for us Excel friends who don't like big equations in there. Turns out, uh, well, it's all it's easy. It's, it, this is a, a linear equation with two equations. You just add them together. <coughs> I mean, that's really all it is if you have two motors. Three equations if you have three because they all have the same form and you combine a bunch of terms. So stall torque just adds, right? So I do it this way with gear ratio and efficiency because you can actually do everything in one swoop. So if you have a gearbox and you know your total gear ratio, let's say you're just gonna use two sims, they're one to one to each other, and, but you have a total gearbox ratio of like 9.5, two to one, let's say. That's the uh, dual, single speed dual ratio gearbox from Vex Pro. Uh, that, you can put those gear ratios in here, and then the end result of your combined motor is actually your gearbox output. And so when I show you the calculator that I did for this, you can go to John's spreadsheet, figure out what you want, and then put those numbers in your actual motor combo, and that will be, that model will be of your actual gearbox. So you have the exact output torques, tor the current behavior, the total current draw that the entire system is going to be, the power, how much power contribution each motor is giving you. And I can tell you this, I thought I knew pretty much everything there was about motor com combining, but when I actually dug into the numbers, it's not that intuitive. Sometimes you want to actually match motor speed at max power. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's crazy because yeah. at free speed, one motor is doing no work yeah. at all. Way no work, like negative 50% work. Um, crazy, but when you combine them and you look at their mat at your design conditions, they combine better there. So uh, the spreadsheet I made makes it, uh, it's going to be a lot to look at here, but when you dive through it, you'll see that it works. So this whole constant thing, Joe just combined terms, I think he used MathCAD, combined terms and got this simple formula for free speed equals tall, tall torque times these two constants divided by the sum of the constants. Turns out the constants are just a bunch of combinations of the free speed, stall torque, and gear ratio. Uh, you can derive, I had, I had to prove to myself that his was equivalent to the way I did it, and through like 10 sheets of paper, I fi finally figured out they're exactly the same. So I've just been using his ever since. <clears throat> uh, we'll go back to, oh, uh, let, me, let me show you some of the, um, the things that the spreadsheet does for you in this. Again, um, it's pretty interesting. All right, so... One of the things I did, you have to use, um, I'm using Excel 2010, so it's a macro-enabled Excel, but it's, and it's using the ActiveX drop boxes, so if you have like an older version, it won't work. Sorry, get the new version. Um, I have a list of all the motors that are legal this year, um, and when you select them, it selects the appropriate whatevers. Now, it turns out the motor combiner can actually be used just to evaluate a single motor if you just select the other two motors to none. Um, there's some rules you got to follow that are over there because I suck at error handling because I'm not a software guy. So um, if you don't follow the rules, it'll give you a bunch of errors. So don't do that. Uh, so what I did was is I made it so that the first two motors, you could look at them like a two-motor combined gearbox. If you put in three, you could look at the three. Um, the, here's your little Ks that don't really matter at the end of the day. You've got gear ratio here and your breaker current. So you can adjust, like, because I like to use 50, sometimes 55, sometimes 60, um, for your breaker current, so you can play with that. I hard-coded the efficiencies. Um, you can override them if you want. It doesn't matter. I, I use efficiency based on gear ratio because I know the rules of thumb, one stage, two stage, three stage. Um, again, max power, speed at max power. Stall current and free current, that's of the total system, so sometimes the numbers vary big, 300 amps, don't be afraid. Um, 
I did individual motor data, two motor drive and three motor drive. And this is where your eyes really open to see what's really going on. So you can, based on speed, speed's the equalizer. So when, they're, when, you're, when you're having a combined motor, whatever speed they're operating at, all the motors are operating at that speed. So you can back out all their characteristics from that. That's why I have those equations that are all based on speed. So you back out from your speed, you can get what each motor's what each motor is speed is at at max power. They should be the same. The torque at max power. A lot of people ask me about the mini sim versus the semi. So just do them one to one. They're fine. Um, you can. You can probe using this at different speeds to see where you want to go, but I also showed you at max power what the motor current was of each individual motor. And the red is a conditional format that if it's over the number you put here, it flags it for you. That's saying, hey, you're over your design current. Um, you can play with gear ratio. You can play with it, relative gear ratios to get those numbers. It's crazy some of the ways it moves. I have to... It, it all mads out, but it's, uh, it was an eye-opener for me. Uh, three motor data, same thing. You can probe at certain values what you want. Uh, total gearbox torque, individual motor torques, individual motor currents. Um, and that is something else. One of the things that people always ask me is like, okay, you say de design for it at 40 amps, and that's great for one motor. What if you have two or three? Like, how do you know if motor you pick to design at 40 amps, the other one isn't at 60? Huh, yeah, good question. It should be easy to solve, not easy. Um, so... It actually reduced down to quite a simple form, but you can't, there's no way you can jump to that form. So one of the things I did, and I, I may change this, so I, I'd like all of you that are here, if you use it, give me feedback, I'll change it. I was going to combine it with John's too, because this by itself isn't quite enough to design this entire mechanism, but it is to get a good understanding of motor combination. Here, I say, so basically, this column is the first motor, this column is the second motor. In this column, I said, okay, my design criteria is 40 amps. Now you guys see why I did equations where current was the dependent or the independent variable, so I could back out all the other information. Um, so here, all the way up to current, is all the parameters that the sims designed at 40 amps, okay? or whatever that current up there that you type in. This number right here is the mini sim that's in that gearbox. That's what current it's running when you design the gearbox that way. So it's telling you what the other motors do or other motors current is. So like in this case, it's good. Now, if I did it the other way, same, everything else the same. I just said, okay, I'm gonna design uh, the gearbox to be such that the mini sim's at 40 amps, while the sim motor's at 50. So those are some things that you can play with. One way is pretty safe, one way is still relatively safe, but not quite pure. Uh, next thing, three motor drive, you could imagine if I did it with three motor drive, it would be very complicated, so I cheated. I just said, okay, this guy's at 40 amps, he's designed at 40 amps. The first motor is the one that's designed at 40 amps. The other two motors are as a result of that. So if you want to look at different motors, you got to flip them. you got to put one in motor one or whatever. Otherwise, this would get too complicated. And again, none. Dip zeros because I suck at error handling. I probably didn't handle that error. But if you had another motor in there, it would do the math for you. It's all real time, all instant. One other cool feature um, is the motor equation over here. It automatically updates when you change stuff. So it, you actually get your equation if you want to do your own thing. You know, if you, you say, okay, I got my motor now. I don't want to use Pulse stuff. I want to use my stuff. But now I have my motor, my equivalent motor, which is what we call it. And then there you go. So that's combining motors more than you probably wanted to know. And I'll tell you what, I, it, it's changing the way I'm designing gearboxes now. Okay, pneumatics. Some of us love pneumatics, some of us hate it. All I have to say about pneumatics is if you decide that you want to use air on your system, use it everywhere. Don't do it for one thing. If you do it for one thing, you're dumb. Okay? Don't do it for one thing. It's too much weight. You can do it with a motor lighter. So if you say, okay, I only need it for one thing, start looking at all your other mechanisms that could use pneumatics. Anything that's at stall, Anything that only needs to be in two positions, sometimes three now to get the right cylinder, pneumatics are the way to go. I've always hated the Clevis rod ones from Bimba, so I would always try to avoid pneumatics, but now I use the SMC NCQ8s. I have them listed here. 
They're um, a pancake style, but they're square, and they have tapped holes at the end, so you can hard mount them to stuff, and you can use them in structure. And they have much bigger um, rods and, and much, much more options. They're a little bit more money, but they're a lot more robust. And the other thing that's made pneumatics more appealing are those large plastic tanks. The ones from New Air. New Air, P-N-E-U-A-I-R-E. -E. Those don't blow up. <laughs> Ever. And they're 44 cubic inches too. Yeah. So they leak? Uh, yeah, so basically we have to buy 20 if we need to, if we want to use 12. <laughs> no, well, they leak over two minutes, but if you don't want to put a pump on your robot, and because it takes seven minutes to pump up seven tanks, so you just have a kid that really likes pneumatics just go through and find the ones that don't leak. That's what we do. And New Air won't take them back, but whatever, I don't care. There's their game. You have that, that high of a fallout ratio on leaking? Yeah, but it takes them over five minutes, man. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want them to leak ever. Have you ever sat in a match waiting for your match no, to start in no, five it's minutes? The, it's the tank that's leaking. It's the tank to the fitting. Yeah, it's okay. it, the design they had to do so they wouldn't have the crack propagation issue that the the other ones had. They had to do this weird thing at the thread interface, and that if you over, it, it's probably self-induced because the kids are over tightening them because mm -hmm. you don't really have to tighten them that much with the plastic. And so once you do that, they creep, and then you're done, and they'll leak forever. No amount of Teflon tape will help you. Okay, sizing is simple. Volume calculations take a little bit more effort. Um, you match is the most simple of, of math. I mean, it's force is pressure times area. One thing that most people don't take into consideration is that your retract force is less than your extend force. And on the smaller cylinders, it's significant amount. So you're shifting transmissions. One direction is always slower than the other. That's why. So those are the formulas. It's simple, it's simple <coughs> geometry for the area. Um, we're allowed 60 PSI max. I rarely use 60 PSI. I try to use the least amount of air possible for two reasons. The main one coming up next. Uh, do I have enough air? The biggest question, especially for those of us that hate using pumps. I don't hate using pumps because of the weight. I hate using pumps because in 2008, when our pump turned on, our robot slowed down because the pump takes a ridiculous amount of current away from the system. Especially now with all the motors that we're using, the pump, it, at all costs, put that stupid thing off the robot. That's my belief. But you got to get this one right. It's not hard to get right, and the little useful calculations thing, I put a little section in there. Um, I actually stole it with permission from the SimBots. It's the one they use. I've been using it for a few years. I asked them if I could publish it. They said yes. So, um, you're allowed 120 PSI storage, use it all. Find the right pressure switch that allows you to get to 120. Some of them are bad and they only allow you to go to 110. So, you can tweak them to get them to go to 120. Uh, it's legal to do that because 120 is their spec. Uh, you're allowed 60 PSI, but like I said, this year we're using 40. If you go much below 35, the solenoids are going to have a hard time actuating because they're air assisted. They're not all electrical energy to move that cylinder. Uh, so the governing equation for this whole do I have enough air is this P1 times V1, pressure volume, It's because uh, air is compressible, so it's a constant pressure volume system. Uh, yeah, let's go back. All right, so the math. The math is easy, really. Um, all right, so... Okay. Uh, so, you make a list of all your, this is the actual one from the 217 robot here, uh, all your, all your uh, functions, your bore, your length, quantity per robot, single or double acting, it matters, Clint, you know this, you're, you're convinced me that I'm going to stock single acting. The spring return ones don't use air in the other direction, right, your cylinders, so uh, actuations per match. That's um, round trip, so three round trips, one round trip, four round trips. So if you put a one here, your air consumption will go down. The pressure you're using them at, you can see I have 40 here. That does two things. One, it uses, just uses less air, but it, more importantly, it gives you more air overhead. Your air overhead is this difference here. So because you can't deplete your tank to zero PSI. You can only deplete your tank to your usable pressure. So by using 40, I just gain another 20. That gives me more cycles. So I'm using less, plus I get more overhead. So I would try to minimize that as much as you can when you're designing your systems. 
So these do uh, the force calculation, which was from the prior page. Those are all extend forces. Uh, volume per cylinder that it's using, and then the total volume per match. So the shifting clearly uses the most. You want to make sure you have enough to shift. Um, and you want to make sure you have enough to climb down the match, although it doesn't matter for us at the moment. Um, <laughs> Max pressure in the tank, max min pressure, required volume is that. Air tank volume, we, we are conservative. It's 44 really, but we use 41. A little bit of safety factor. Required air tank is 4.2. Uh, and one time we thought we were going to shift more than that, so we had six. It works. This is a very conservative way to do it. Um, it doesn't take into account you get a little bit extra oomph from the compressibility of the fluid more than, the, it's not straight linear. so. Um, but this works great. You can you can add columns or add rows to this, and uh, you won't have to guess about pneumatic. I think most people guess about pneumatic cylinders, and you don't have to. It's actually quite easy. <clears throat> uh, so I threw those all into one one little spreadsheet here. It's it's not super refined, but. Well, do you have any sort of leakage? No, we we don't stop until we don't leak. That was the whole tank thing. That's why we throw away tanks. So we do the tanks first individually, then we do the regulator system individually, and then we do the solenoids individually, and then we combine them together and then test them there. Are you just using the standard uh, pressure gauge? No, we're using the bubble test. Well, pressure gauge and then the bubble test. Oh, yeah. yeah. But we do everything over five minutes, because we find that, that if you find your way on Einstein or other places, it's at least that long. And they're very mean to you when you're out there. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's not funny. It's very bad. Uh, okay, some robot examples. I'll spare you the gory details, but drivetrain. So we designed it with four sims and two mini sims, uh, four inch uh, VectorPro traction wheels, four inch VectorPro Omni wheels. That's how we're doing the shifting. Five to one gear ratio on the Omnis, 11.25 to one traction. If you were paying attention earlier, 36 over 16 times five is 11.25 to one. So uh, we'll look at the math quickly. Uh, I literally use John, uh, John B. Noon's calculator here. So um, uh, originally, I, we had uh, four sims and four mini sims on the robot, but we had weight issues, so we pulled them off. So that's what you see here. I had to simplify because he doesn't do motor combining in his spreadsheet. That's why, using my conjunction with this, I'm going to go back and do it and see what results I get. But this jives pretty much to our testing. So you can copy and paste the motor data here. You can, John allows you to do some fudging for speed loss for your drivetrain. So if you know that your drivetrain is not quite at free speed, which we all know it's not, you can put that in there. Uh, number of gearboxes in the drivetrain, number of motors per gearbox. That's how I had the eight, right? Total robot weight, weight out of the driven wheels, wheel diameter, wheel coefficient. Those are that's the Vectro rough top tread. Uh, there's your five to one. Um, so high gear, low gear, there's my 16 to 36. 18.54 feet per second, adjusted speed 15, we're actually more like about 17.5. Uh, but look at your driving and pushing match, so you better drop those wheels if you're doing a pushing match. Low gear, design, um, just because I like that ratio, and we really just wanted to stay put, we don't use it for driving that much. Uh, plenty of having 30 amps all day, every day. His isn't that accurate. I'm, I'm certain this isn't that accurate. I'll publish when I publish the paper on this recalculated with the individual motors uh, dive, when I dive into them. Dived into them. Uh, so there it is. Pretty straightforward. You can do this stuff fast now uh, with all the commercial gearboxes that are available. You can spend uh, more time on you know, more fun stuff. Okay, pneumatic system. We already went through it. Just a couple of things. I wanted to poke fun of myself about the climber. Uh, a little bit, so you guys don't make fun of me. Um, the SMC NCQ8 series cylinders, they have a limitation in that their um, largest stroke is four inches. They go from half inch to four inch in pretty much any increment you want. They go from half inch bore to four inch bore in pretty much any increment you want. They have a million options, but only certain ones are in stock. Um, if there's enough interested, interest generated in these things, I'll start stocking them. But right now, I just buy ours from SMC, which is where we get all of our pneumatic stuff. Uh, like I said, we already looked at the math. Now, we talked a lot about the engineering. What I didn't talk about is the design part of it. So I want to talk a little bit about that. 
uh, with regards to the 217 climber. So we reallocated motors to the climber. So I actually we actually have two sims and two mini sims on the climber now as we move the, all to the drive. From an engineering standpoint, we did all the math. We used the job menu calculator. Engineering the thing is sound, pure, dead pure. From a design standpoint, we were in a whole heap of trouble that we've been fighting for five weeks because when we did the initial layout of the robot, we did not allocate enough space for the climb. So while the thing, once it starts getting up there, it's going to be lightning fast. Who knows if it'll ever get there because the design was jacked. So there's two elements to this. I focus mostly on the math because that's where I see where most teams are having their issues when they have issues. Um, but it's, it's not just all about that. So fundamentally, uh, this climber and the 1114 climber are exactly the same. The difference, they left like seven inches for the climber to go up and over. We left like three and a half. And that's the biggest difference. And it's all, des that's just design. That was just design choice. It had nothing to do with engineering. So just make sure you think of both when you're doing your mechanisms or your designs. Whatever you deem is your most important feature, you better have extra room for that thing. Um, because the thing's a thing of beauty, but we, we backed ourselves in a corner that we'll probably never be able to get out of. And that's, uh, so good. We left 10 minutes for questions, or if you want me to go through anything in more detail or back up, talk about anything else. Yeah, they're actually not complicated. That's not the thing that's messing us up right now. Yeah, I can explain it. Um, so it's done the cheater way. And what I mean is it's not, it's not powered out because it doesn't have to be. Because that's, that's just the way to get the thing out there. All the power is done pulling in. So give me a sec. Actually, the kid who did this one did a really good job with all the constraints and stuff, so it's pretty dynamic and moving and all that other fun stuff. I just have to find it. Okay, so there's two stages and then a tilt here. So this stage, there's um, linear springs on posts, the constant force linear springs from the master car the three-quarter inch wide ones that go along and attach to the robot base, okay? The only reason for the linear springs is to make sure the thing goes the last little bit of travel. We use latex tubing underneath, which was the aha moment we had at Troy that we just didn't have that quite right. We finally found a nice, again, all about space. Like, have no space to put anything. We found a home for that. Uh, so really, you just linear extend. What we did, um, because we love sheet metal and we get it for free, Everything is sheet metal except for the fiberglass rods, which I'll explain a little bit later. We, again, we try to get everything for free. So since Vex Pro has 3 8 flange bearings, that's what I use because I get it for free. So we use the Vex Pro hex stock, get it for free. Um, with, so the bearings ride along. They pinch the sheet metal. I have two eighth inch pieces, so it's a quarter inch thick. Um, they ride along that and the flanges on both sides keep it from moving either way. Turns out that um, that works pretty good, but in, to leave enough clearance to make that right, um, you got to do a little bit extra so the thing doesn't flex too much. So for the second stage, we went down to one bearing. To, we needed to eke out more. That was another design problem we had. We didn't have enough travel. We eked out more travel by shortening this, going to one. Same principle, just pitching top and bottom. Works great. Um, but we use this HDPE block that just drilled holes in it that the fiberglass rod, half-inch fiberglass rod, um, slide through. Linear spring on that. That thing is, we actually designed, I actually designed that in from the start. So uh, that thing has never failed, been great. The ones on the side, they, they hit the pulley every once in a great while, and they, those things are very finicky. So if you ever use them, they're great, but you've got to make sure they stay nice and flat. This one here is constrained, running along the flat, has been beautiful. The two on the side, one's been good because it has a little more space than the other. Uh, so latex tubing pulls it in, and then we have the pulley, and we literally just grab on the hook and just pull the hook up. So all the force is in the, between the strap and the hook. 
So literally, this stuff doesn't see any force except the fiberglass rod because of stupid bumps on the pyramid. They deflect like, I don't know, crazy. They crazy deflect. 1114 is the same method. They just flipped it. Their second stage is where they're flexible. So their last stage is rigid, and their middle stage is delvin rods. Same basic principle. Um, they love those linear slides from McMaster Car, the ones that they love those things. That's what they use, but it's a very similar principle. Our original one, we had a cable pulling in and out. While that worked okay, we had a hard time balancing the tension between the two. One will go super slack. We haven't quite figured that out. But this, we like this method. We really like this method. So if we had designed more room, it would be super robust. I'm convinced. So that's, that's how it's pretty simple how that works. So you just, you, you live with the degree of flex in the hard drive rod because once you pull it back in, it goes to, and it straightens all out inside. The yeah, you have, um, the original, uh, this is climber version four, I think. I call it V3, but V1 was a magnet, which was cool, but didn't work. Um, <laughs> this is the third version of this. The first two were rigid. Couldn't get it to work because it fights the pyramid. It literally tries to pull itself into the pyramid. You, yeah. need, you need a point of flex in one of those two joints. So yeah, you, for this particular one, you have to live with it. But for many other years that people have done the, I'm convinced you can balance it so the thing shoots up. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, yeah. No problem. So yeah, it, and if you need the designs, I'll, I'll show them to you. I'll even show the ones that didn't work because they actually, <laughs> they actually worked great for just a regular linear up and down. Yeah, it's, that pyramid is wicked. Wicked. Way harder than I thought. <clears throat> uh, okay, any other questions? All right, uh, thanks for your time. If you want, at the end of this, I've got all, I had my guys email it to me, so I have a list of the coupon codes if you'd like them. Um, we can do it right after this. I know we have short time because something matches start at 3.30. Opening ceremonies is three. Opening ceremonies is right now. All right. Thanks for attending.